I build the relationship with my LPs that they know what to expect. So it's like every new deal, they don't have to ask what's the terms on this one. Hey, what's you know what's this and that on this on this one. So every deal is the exact same. Do it eight prep, seventy thirty. Um, so thirty percent promote, seventy percent VLPs with no adjustment. My theory is that if I can you know massively outperform, then they'll be around longer, and that's you know good for everybody. First, welcome to the Lead In Podcast where we dive deep into genuine stories of leaders who've seized control of their journey. This podcast is brought to you by LeadHub, your growth partner for the trades. And now, I'm going to kick it over to our guy, Austin Lenny. Guys, welcome, welcome. We got, you know, the fact that you're smiling right now in this real estate market tells me that you're better than the better better than the most. So, uh, we got my man in the house. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So, you know, we connected recently. I've followed you for a little bit, so I don't know too much about you. So why don't you tell uh, the audience kind of your, your story and, and how you got here? Yeah, so my story, so I'm, I'm 30. Um, I started my first company when I was in college. I was 19. It was a uh, playground construction company. So we would, I hired a couple of my buddies and in the summers we would go around and we'd build, we'd build playgrounds at parks and schools and subdivisions and, um, you know, basically the playgrounds that you see commercial, all commercial playgrounds. I guess we did some residential playgrounds as well. And then we did some decks. We, you know, we painted some houses. So sort of, uh, you know, did a mixture. Basically we do, we do playground work and then when we were slow with the playgrounds, we'd go knock on doors and we would, we would paint decks and stain decks and um, do that. So it was a ton of fun. And then, um, so that would have been, let's see, I was 19. And then I was 21, I got my real estate license and I started selling houses just as a real estate agent. My, my big picture goal, like when I was younger, and I guess still is today, but um, was to get into private equity. It looked like fun and, and it always seemed like it always seemed like fun to me, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't go to, to Michigan or to Harvard or, you know, one of those places and go to New York and do like the big, you know, institutional, um, scope. So to me, it was like, okay, how can I get exposure to private equity without going that route? And I thought maybe real estate. So I got my real estate license and I thought maybe that would expose me to it somehow. And turns out it did It actually worked out perfectly. So I did, um, so yeah, I was, I was, I was 19, started the playground company and then I was 21, got my real estate license. Those overlapped like a year. It took me nine months to sold, sell my first house. Then I sold my first house. I was in school at the time too. So during this whole process, school kind of took a back door. I ended up going for, you know, full time for three years, part time for four or five more years. And then I dropped out cause it was just, you know, it was, I was done at that point. But, um, so yeah, so, so playground business when I was 19, real estate license when I was 21, this was 2015. And then in 2017, I discovered multifamily and I, I, I don't remember exactly what, uh, led me towards it or where I saw it or whatever. Um, but it, I think it was when I was at the real estate law office, another agent, he was selling some big house and, and his client was a commercial developer. And I was like, that, that seems fun. And like, clearly the guy as well. So Um, so then I started to look into that more and then I met another guy locally that was doing it. Uh, and he was actually a couple years younger than I was. And I was, you know, whatever, 23, 24 at the time. So I thought, okay, if you know, this guy who's 20, you know, two years younger than I am can do it. There's no reason I can't. So, um, started learning to listen into books, podcasts, learning everything I could. And then in 2019, I sent a mailer out to 500 apartment owners the first mailer landed on a 50, one, one of them landed on a 56 unit apartment. And then the broker, um, the broker was a family friend. So I went direct to the seller, but they, they just sent it to their broker. The broker emailed me and said, Hey, this is a family. They're getting out of the business. These properties have never been sold before, but they have 11 others. Do you want those two? And I just told them, yes, you know, blindly. And, uh, so it ended up being 232 units. It was 12 properties and I wrote the first offer for 13 and a half million and I had about 50 grand in the bank and had never done a deal okay. before. Oh, okay. Hold on, hold on. 
So how many properties had you sold as a real estate agent at this point? A decent amount. I did I did okay as a as a realtor. I was selling like ten million a year, so probably twenty houses okay. a year. So I had sold Did you have any did you have any investment properties before this? No. Zero. Okay. So so your experience was I had sold some properties and I started this business in college and then now thirteen million dollars worth of real estate, I'm gonna figure it out. Exactly. So, okay, before, before I want to hear the whole story, was there, look, I say yes to things all the time, especially in my younger days. Was there any part before the yes or after the yes when you thought, what the hell am I doing? Not really, because it sort of just, it worked out. Okay. You know, it didn't get okay. to the stage, it didn't get to the stage of like being in trouble. Okay, I so, get what you're saying. Yeah. So it never like, it was always just like, this is, this is going to plan. Okay. All right. So you write the offer for the 13 million and then what happens? <laughs> so I wrote the offer for 13 million, 13 and a half. And then they countered at like 16 something. And so then I, I was like, okay, this is, this could be real. So I brought it to the guy that I mentioned that had, uh, was a couple years younger than me. He was partnered with a few other guys that had, you know, some gray hairs, right? They, they had been in the business, they had bought, you know, syndicated a bunch of deals. And so I brought it to him and then they, he basically led the deal from that point and I kind of just rode the coattails. And so we ended up getting it under contract. It was a complete ordeal because there was six family members involved, but we ended up getting it under contract uh, in March of 2020. So this was November, November 19 is actually the day before opening day, uh, hunting season that I wrote the offer. And then we got into contract four months later, which was crazy to think about. Um, we got under contract, they put up the earnest money. So they did, uh, I think two, I think 300,000 non-refundable day one. And so that was great, right? Without that, it would have been very difficult to get the, the deal. I didn't have that money to do it. I didn't know who I would go to to get that money. And it sort of just worked out. And then, so we went under contract just before COVID shut everything down. Like we did our due diligence tours on Friday, uh, walking every unit. And on Monday, the entire state of Michigan shut down. So it was a pretty chaotic time. And then, you know, the banks required, okay, all these COVID reserves and everything else. And then the seller actually came to us and said, Hey, you know, we're expecting you guys to like retrade. Like, are you going to ask for a price reduction because of everything going on? And we weren't at the time, but we're like, well, you know, if you're, if you're asking us, if we're going to like, clearly you're okay with it. So I think we asked them for like $2 million off. And I, I, I if I remember correctly, I think they gave us like 1.8 off. Like, I don't, you know, I don't entirely understand why, but they did. Um, and then while we were under contract, so then we, you know, we had a 90 day period or whatever, obviously we hit with COVID delays over COVID delays, just constant. And I think in May we had another local group that heard about it, found out we were under contract and wanted to buy all of them from us. And we said, well, you know, we don't want to sell out everything to you, but we'll sell you, we'll sell you some of them. So we ended up, ended up selling eight of the properties uh, in a double closing to two different buyers for a million for profit. And then we kept the other four. We sold three of them a year and a day after we had closed on them. So we did staggered closings, like a building a week from August to October. It was like this building, close this one this week, this one next week, you know, because they're all different entities and different um, so it was an ordeal, but August to October, we, we did staggered closings and closed them all. And then we had sold the eight and kept the four. And now we've gone full cycle on everything. The one we, we still have one 20 unit deal. We had paid a million two fifty or a million three or so, you know, somewhere in that range for that one. And we refinanced it and appraised for 4.6 million. So it was, it was a deal. So how, how, if you just had to guess how much profit have you made off the whole deal? If you just, if you just threw out a number out there. 
Me personally, mm, several, I mean, to- total, like a couple million, several million. Okay. Uh, okay. Me personally is less than a million, but might be four or 500 ish, give or take. Mm-hmm. So your your percentage in the deal was significantly Small. smaller. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So my my but percentage you, of the the double closing wholesale ahead. part of it was fifteen percent, and okay. then okay. my percentage of the deals that we kept was five or, or was ten percent of the GP, and so the and then the GP on those deals ended up being fifty percent. So you know it was a fifty percent promote, okay. right? So. Um, Mm-hmm. And the the guy that I partnered with, the way he structured the one that we still own was with a 20% uh, buyout to all the investors. So it's like at any time he, he could buy all of the other investors out for a 20% annualized return. So um, when we refinanced, he, he had bought every, all the other investors out with the property. So, uh, you know, today I own seven and a half or something percent of the deal. Okay. But yeah, very small. So there's, there's a know, lot. It, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. I, but but I'm more interested in, um, I, I've always, for the life of me, especially because I spent many of my years in real estate, um, flipping a house or, um, which I did Airbnb for years, a large scale and small scale, feels so monotonous to me. I'm not saying that it, you can't uh, get wealthy that way. But I, I look back on that deal, no matter how much percentage you had, the intangibles from it, um, your life will never be the same because of that deal. And sure. in a regular scenario, it could have took you 10 years to get to do a deal like that if you would have started small. As you sit, sit back now and look at it, you know, on that vein, like what's your, what's your context to anybody that's out there getting started? Yeah, that's exactly it. I look back and it's like, you know, and I've had other people tell me like, wow, you got screwed. Like you should have gotten way more of the deal. And to me, it's, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, would have been great. But I, the, the amount that I learned and the contacts and the people and just the process that I learned from that. I mean, so, so we bought that deal or we, we did that deal. And then from August to October, but in May, I got another deal under contract on my own. So it was a 24 unit that we actually just signed in a, a PA to sell last week. So, um, a 24 unit with 10 vacant units that we had, that I bought on my own, or, or, you know, I syndicated on my own, uh, in November. And then I bought another one in February. So it's like from that deal, I learned the process. And by the time that deal closed, I had already had two more deals under contract to, and then that eventually closed one. We we've already gone full cycle on that we bought in February of 21, it paid a million eight. We just sold it for 2.75. It's like a 22% net IRR to LPs with a 50% promote. So, um, and how old are you? How old are you? 30. Okay. So the same guys that are complaining that you got screwed over are the same guys that would still be doing the same thing 20 years from now. And you're at 30 doing deals like these. And so yeah. like perfect example is like, I put a deal together. <clears throat> I'm just, I've never shared personally because it just happened last year. I just had a guy come to me and said, I've been trying to sell this business for years. I can't find a buyer. And I, I was in a meeting with a group of people and I just said, I can find you a buyer in like five minutes. And he goes, who, who the hell do you think you are? You cocky. So yeah. I said, no, do you want a buyer? Or do you not want a buyer? I don't understand. Do you want a buyer? Or do you not want a buyer? He goes, I want a buyer. I said, okay. So I set up the zoom call the next day cool. I just got off the Zoom call. I disappeared for six months and ran my businesses. I didn't even know anything was going on. I get some money wired into my account and I go, what is this? And they go, oh yeah, that deal closed. And I'm like, what deal? What are you talking about? (laughs) And they go, the deal that you introduced us. I I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, hold on, let's, let's unpack this. What deal closed and how much money did it close for? And they go, oh, well, it was the largest deal of my career. We, 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 bought the, we sold a $70 million company. And I go, excuse me? What? 
And so I said, can I see the d- data on these deals, right? And so I go see it. And let's be honest, I got screwed out of some money because I didn't know. I wasn't even expecting money, so it doesn't matter to me. I got paid a little bit, nothing crazy. But yeah. the brokers, I mean, they made you know 120x. I mean, they made some straight cheddar, like real big stuff. Yeah. And everybody goes, everybody goes, oh, you got screwed. You got screwed. And I'm like, I didn't even know that was possible. And now I do. And now uh, that happened. So the credit and the understanding that that's possible tells me that uh, I can go do that myself. And I don't care. Right. Yeah, and it's and huge. Like, I mean, everybody's it, just looking at short term. They're looking at short term. Yeah, exactly. I, I've always kind of looked at it that way. It's like, it, you know, you, in general, you're not going to get rich mm-hmm. off of one deal. And so it's, no. you know, and for my first deal to be 232 units, like what it did for me. So I was a real estate agent. I was selling like 10 million a year. I was, I was taking home like 200 grand. Right. So I, I was doing okay. Right. It wasn't, mm-hmm, I, I was mm-hmm. perfectly happy or, you know, I wasn't perfectly happy, but I was doing good by most standards. Um, but on that first deal, when, when the first part of it closed, I, I made over 200 grand, like right there. I, it's just a wire <laughs> to my account. And so it's like, okay, that's a year of working as an agent. Like now I don't have to go work as an agent. I can just focus on, on the apartment business full time. And so that was huge because it gave me that, that time. And I guess the confidence it's like, okay, worst case scenario, I got a year of runway or two years of runway on Mm -hmm. what my living, you know, I, I was spending maybe a hundred grand to live at the time. So it's like, okay, I got two years of runway. If I can't buy something in two years, then I'm an idiot and I'll just go back to selling houses. Like, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to sell houses. It's super easy. Yeah. And yeah. it's not, you know, it's yeah. not like insanely easy, but you know, it's a very low barrier to entry. So I always had that. It's well, like, I think, I, I mean, I still have my license today. It's like if, if well, at the time it's like, okay, if I can't buy a deal in two more years, but I just did one and I got on my first mail, granted it's like, you know, a lot of delusion, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it, uh, it worked out and it's worked, <laughs> it's worked out still, uh, still today. I was listening to a podcast a couple of years ago and this guy said, he goes, he goes, I've never bought a real estate deal that I've held on to for seven years plus that I've lost money. And he goes, all you guys don't pay attention. He goes, I bought hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate. And you know, the fact of the matter is my big takeaway a couple of years ago was too many people are getting into investing, right? Just in general to save their life instead of enhance their life. Like yeah. this is not this is not even in business. Like these things take time and it's not something that's going to just happen overnight. And so if you approach it with the right scenario or the right uh, energy, it's going to compound over time. And you know, you've watched regular people just buy a house a year, you know, and and stock it stay. I mean, I always remember the story my mom worked for a guy his grandfather passed away when he was 16 and his grandfather left him some money and over the span of 20 years he bought uh, every single family house in a four street radius in Incredible. southeast texas he owns the entire street he's never worked a day in his life and he fishes in montana and alaska the whole year yeah yeah it's great i mean it's not it's it's one of those things that's uh simple but not easy i would say mm-hmm. But it takes a lot of discipline. And why to, is it not easy? Is it well, discipline? because it's like you, you, you need to know the process, right? Like I talk to people about it and friends of mine who are not in real estate. Mm-hmm. And it's just such a foreign concept, so much of what I do. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like you need to have that exposure to it somewhere and in, in, in go and learn that process. And it's, for me anyway, it's very hard to learn the process without doing it. I'm like a you know, you can tell me something, but I got to do it to really, to really know it. Um, Mm -hmm. and then to be able to do it confidently. But I think that's the, that's the part that's not obviously not easy, but it's, it's simple numbers game. It's like, okay, I can buy this deal for 50 a door, you know, make these improvements. Now it's worth 90 and then we sell it or if we were to hold it or whatever, but it's like, it's, you know, when the math, when you're able to break the math down, it's very, very simple. But it's just going out and executing on that simple vision and having the knowledge to and the, and the confidence and the contacts and everything to be able to do that. So I think that for me personally, and maybe I'm a different cat, like uh, if I were to invest 
in you or somebody else that I trust, I don't actually need to see the deal at all. I don't care. It doesn't yeah, matter. That's true. Me. As an LP, like, you don't. You, you know, I'm a, I'm a person. I'm a person and I invest in people. Like the jockey is the king, right? Like yep. if he's got a good track record, it's great. Well, here's the problem. <laughs> the problem is, is there's a lot of people that portray themselves. Syndication, especially in the last couple of years, especially with the way the, uh, the market shifted, you know, has got yeah, bad name, same way private equity does. I think a lot of For people sure. have short term understanding. I, I have my own. Uh, I've I've seen a lot of where the bodies are buried personally, um, yeah. and it's just mind numbingly to me. You know, what do you think that a that a traditional person from the outside looking in has wrong about syndication right now? You know, I don't know. It, it's hard because it's we we get so much in the bubble of it, so it's like you see everything mm-hmm. and you notice everything. But I think the regular people that are LPs are are not seeing the stuff, right? It's like we're, you know we're reading the real deal every day. We're on Twitter every day, and and it's like you see you see the news cycle that that we're subscribing to or that we're interested in. Whereas most of the LPs, the true LPs, I, I think, and you know, unless they're like institutional level and that's all they do, but if they're out there working a W two job, like they don't have time to care about what some idiot in Texas foreclosed on twenty five hundred units, like unless they're in the deal. But from what I've seen, you know, most people in general still have no clue about what, you know, what's going on with all the scumbags that have done stupid stuff over the last couple of years and now they're getting burned. But, um, you know, unless they're in the deals, they, it's, it's generally not talked about, I guess. So for me, Mm -hmm. you know, for, for skin syndicators, obviously it's, it's become like a derogatory term over the last two years, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. but it's, it, it's sort of like everything, right? There, there are a ton of people in it and there's a ton of people that are trying to be in it. Um, you know, people will buy one building and it's like, yeah, technically they are a syndicator, but they'll portray themselves as like, you know, they're, they're doing something great or they're a co GP on 200 units. And they'll say they have 30 million of AUM or whatever, but it's hard to, you know, I, I don't get too focused on that. I sort of just stick to stick to what I'm doing, do the right thing and, and do the right thing for our investors rather than get, I don't like to get caught up in the weeds of what other people are doing. I don't put out there like, oh, this guy is an idiot. Like, I, I just, I just sort of avoid that, uh, the topic and the process and in all of the, you know, the news cycle of it, because it's like at any point in probably anybody's life, someone could pick a moment and say, you're an idiot. Why would you do that? And it's like, mm-hmm. these people, you know, grand, you know, a lot of them are scumbags, but you pick anyone's life, pick a moment in time. It's like, you're a moron. You're, you're a terrible person. Why'd you do that? But, um, yeah. you know, so I don't like to get into the weeds on, on the news cycle of it, I guess, is, is my general thought on that process or on that topic. Mm-hmm. And a question I've actually never asked anybody personally, um, you know, how important is your reputation to you? Like, and how, how, like, how, how do you view that? And like, how do you keep it protected? Yeah. I mean, I view it as it's like the most important thing. So for me, it's like, and I'm still early in my career, right? So, you know, I plan to do this for, for a long time. You know, we've bought, we, we've been successful so far. We didn't buy a deal from July of 22 until February of this year because I didn't find anything that I thought fit our investment criteria uh, or what we were really looking to do. And then we sold three deals that all went well last year. And then now this year we bought five. Um, so it's been a good year from an acquisition standpoint. But yeah, reputation is everything. To me, it's like, I, I feel like if I do if I do a bad deal or if I, if I do, if I were to do something stupid, um, it, it basically takes me out of business for life is sort of how I view it. Not sort of, it is how I view it. It's like, if I, if I make a mistake and if I, if I do something stupid, then I'm out of business for life. And that's not really an option for me. Mm-hmm. And the most fascinating, if I could spend my whole career, because I love a good mindset thing, if I could spend my whole career just uh, diagnosing and uh, asking questions of multifamily investors who don't buy, I think it's one of the most fascinating things in the world uh, when you had the discipline to not pull the trigger 
how do you keep yourself emotionally stable to m be disciplined to not feel like you have the itch to just buy something to buy something yeah that is the hard thing because it's like you know in theory we could buy something it's like if you can get it funded you can buy it and and we could get it funded right we can get the debt we can get the debt we can get the equity all of our raises this year have filled like within an hour besides one was the first one we we raised for i sent an email out on 2 p.m on a friday and i had a million dollars committed by 10 a.m saturday and then all of them after that have had over a million dollars committed in an hour and been full you know these are smaller deals so um you know it's like in theory i could fund uh a deal if i put it out and and you can you know obviously make a model tell you whatever you want right Mo in a, a model or in excel is always a lie it's just a matter of how far off it is and and you know you can't get those perfectly accurate but um i don't know i i suppose for me to to not buy it's just like i i, I know deep down it, you know if if i was doing something bad it, it's like i i don't know i just i guess i just don't really i don't have it in me um you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel good about it. I'd feel weird about it. The other thing too is like, you know, I'm, I'm personally guaranteeing these loans and a lot of my family, like immediate family is investors in my deals. So it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to go personally guarantee the loan and then I'm going to take my family's money, uh, or some of it, right. Or some of my family and friends and people that I know and go to church with and everything else and put their money into a bad deal. And that would just, I mean, it's just a terrible idea. So I sort of, for, for me, it's, I've never really looked at it as an option. Like, Hey, let me go do this deal real quick. I'll make, you know, X amount of money and from an acquisition fee and that'll be great. But I've never, like I said, I've never contemplated it because of, I have too much to lose, I guess, from a, from a relationship rep, reputation standpoint, I, I have, I have too much to lose to to force something that I know at my core is a bad deal. Hmm. And, you know, what's kind of your um, rules when it comes to like, you know, I think syndication and kind of raising money can get extremely complicated. Like give us like a basic breakdown of how you view like bringing in LPs and do you like to keep it simple and just kind of this is the way we roll different deals, different terms, obviously. No, I go same terms every deal. So I go same okay. terms every deal okay. because I like to keep it simple. So it's like I I want to build okay. I want to build the relationship with my LPs that they know what to expect. So it's like every new deal, they don't have to ask what's the terms on this one. Hey, what's you know what's this and that on this on this one. So every deal is the exact same from a structure standpoint. And it wasn't always like this. This is I just you know came up with this basically last year, and because before I had I would sort of tailor it to the deal. Um, but yeah, so, so every deal is the same. So we do it eight prep 70, 30. Um, so 30% promote 70% to the LPs with no adjustment. You know, a lot of people will do a, a hurdle and it's like, once you hit a 15, it drops to 50, but I just do 70, 30 all the way through. My theory is that if I can, you know, massively outperform, then they'll be around longer and that's, you know, good for everybody versus trying to, for me to make all the money on one single deal. I had started my first couple of deals that I, that I syndicated on my own. I guess the very first one, I just did an 80, 20, no prep. Um, and then after that, I was doing a seven or 8% prep with a 50% promote because that's what the guy that I had partnered with on the first deal did. And I didn't, I didn't know any different. Right. So to me, it's like, that's how you structure it. Um, and then once I got into it and learned like, you know, 50% promote, and I got some pushback on it at, at one point and I was, I was, uh, so I decided to change it then, but, but yeah, so eight prep 70, 30, we'll do a two or 3% acquisition fee. Um, and then 1% asset management fee on the equity. I think, uh, what, imp you know, I, I talked to a lot of people. Um, I think what impressed me the most about, and, and just so you are younger than me, by by by. 11 plus 12 years so but what impressed me the most about your generation uh, on the good side not not on the bad side of this yeah is that you were making 200 grand a year and you're saying to yourself like not not that you need all the trappings of it but you're saying this isn't good enough it's not i don't even think it was the money i think it was how you're making the money right 
Um, I coach a lot of young guys who make good money, but they're like, this isn't enough for me. I want, you know, full control of my life. You know, I want options. I want more freedom. I want wealth. I think that's what excites me the most about kind of the mindset. Where would you say, where did you learn it from? Was it your parents? Is it just kind of being around the right mentors? Like where did, where did you pick up this kind of, uh, poise you have at 30 years old? Yeah, my my dad for sure. So my dad worked for Ford for 20, 25 years and then he started uh, his company. So he he ha- owns a playground supply company. Um, you know, they're a, mm-hmm. they're a park and rec supplier basically in the Midwest. And he started that when I was it was like 2006, I would have been let's see 12, I think in 2006. But so like I saw him through his through the early years of of him building that business. You know, he would he would get up at four in the morning and go to the office and then he'd get home at, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And and so I saw that, that process of like sort of what it takes to, to build something. And I thought it was cool. And I think that was super important, right? 12 to 15, 16, 17. It's like, those are your super impressionable years where, um, you know, I think what you are exposed to really sticks with you. And so that was a big thing for me was realizing that, Hey, you know, going out and starting your own business, um, you know, is it, is it a good path to take, you know, at the beginning it was, it was, it's not like he was making a ton of money or, you know, he took a Mm -hmm. massive pay cut from what he was at Ford and, you know, I'm the third of nine kids. So it's like, okay, you know, very stable, secure job (laughs) at Ford to, to, to nothing. God bless your mom. To selling swing sets. (laughs) So, um, you know, it worked out. He's super happy that he did it, but, but a big reason why he did it was because it looked, it was more fun and he always wanted to do something that was more fun uh, rather than, you know, working for Ford and, and doing that, which he enjoyed and whatever. But, um, you know, that looked like more fun to him. So he decided to go do that. And so that's sort of what I've taken to is like everything that I do it started because, Hey, that looks like fun. Like I'm going to go do that. And then, you know, certainly there's parts of it that, that are miserable or you don't like as much, but in general, I, like, I love what I do. It's like, I have so much fun. I meet great people. It's, it's, uh, it's a blast. So, you know, I saw that. And then as a real estate agent, you're like, you're constantly chasing the next deal. There's nothing, you're not building equity. You're not doing anything. Right. So to me, um, that was a big factor to getting into apartments or, you know, to with the big picture goal of being full scale private equity at some point is because you're building something that you can eventually sell and you can eventually retire from. And then you have the time freedom, right? When I was an agent, if I missed a call, it's like, okay, I might miss 20 grand because I missed one phone call. That was a very realistic scenario. Mm. Um, happened several times yeah. actually. And so I, I, you know, I was never on vacation and whatever, but you know, now it's the time freedom is, is significantly better. And it's, you know, I, I'm 30 years old, I'm married. So, um, you know, I sort of look at it as like, you try to like pull yourself back into reality. Cause it's, I, I don't live like a normal life probably for a 30 year old by most means, but, uh, it's not, you know, it's not anything too, too insane. I would say, I would say one of the wildest things as you get older, I was two to three weeks at the helm of uh, CEO of HVAC Plumbing and Electric Company. And the first thing I did was call my father. And I said, you did this for 44 years and raised us and did sports? I was like, you're out of your mind. I was like, how did you, how did you run your small business, your dentist practice and grow it? And it was very successful. Like, and, you, and you raised us? Like, I was like, all the respect in the world. Yeah. Like it was a real eye opening moment for me, full circle. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, especially you know. Granted, you know, my mom stayed at home, obviously, but uh, yeah, nine kids is is no, <laughs> you know, it's no small responsibility, I guess. You know, and we were all at home too. So like, I was twelve. My oldest brother mm-hmm. was fifteen, and the youngest was um two, maybe. I don't know, somewhere in that range. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love it. I was at my buddy's house in Nashville this past week while I was there for business. 
and uh, he's negotiating like a huge land deal while the three-year-old is butt naked running through the house and the uh, other one's on rollerblades inside the house. And he just looks at me and he goes, yeah, this is my life, negotiating million plus land deals while the, 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 the inmates are running around. I just <laughs> think it's so funny. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's just so funny. You know, it's like where we are. It's like I step out of the podcast or the office and it's like, you know, your, your family's right there. It's just a wild time, especially a lot of people working from home. So if people want to find you, they want to track you down, they want to reach out to you. How will they do that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, social media is <coughs> the easiest, the fastest. Um, you know, Twitter, Twitter, I'm most active. I go in, uh, I go in spurts of being active on Twitter, but, um, yeah. And then, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I'm less active on, on Instagram, but LinkedIn is, um, you know, I'll post on there once in a while and talk with people quite a bit on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and then we have a, I, I do a weekly, uh, newsletter. So that's been, you know, a major key to, to building our business also has been the weekly newsletter. So I talk about the actual like specifics in our deals, the numbers, the debt, I call it the capital stack. So I talk about the debt and the equity and the terms of the debt, you know, what we did for each deal, how we found it, what we liked about it, what the business plan was, and then how it's going today. So actually our last newsletter, uh, I actually be sending it to, out today is a quarterly portfolio review. So I dig into all of our deals that we currently own and say, okay, where was it when we bought it? Where is it today? Um, so people, you know, people have enjoyed that as far as, uh, sort of get a, a, a real time investor update in a sense, like it's, it's watered down some, but you know, we give our investors the, the full scope, but I like to give high level to, to everybody because I have so many people that have expressed interest in investing and then they sort of want to watch, it's, you know, usually I'll talk to people and, or a lot of times I'll talk to people, they'll pass on the first deal that comes up and they'll want to watch and see how that goes. And it's like, it's hard because if real estate, you don't know until like, through, like a value at deal. It's like, mm. it's going to be three years till we know if this is for like as good as expected or not as good, or, you know, it's going to be a three year process until this sort of plays out. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of people that, that enjoy reading those. But yeah, so the, the newsletter is the capitalstacknewsletter.com. And then, yeah, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, any social media, I'm, I'm active. Your, uh, your comment about the Excel spreadsheet was my favorite because Chris uh, Grinzik, who's a friend of mine, uh, he, he said one time on a call, he said, you're over here doing five-year projections uh, on your Excel spreadsheet and nobody knows what's going to happen past six months. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Just, and they bought like six hundred million dollars worth of real estate. So uh I just think it's the truth. I think I think it's just there for guardrails. It's not really uh right. the truth per se. Yeah, it's like it, I mean to me it's like yeah. a real estate is a simple business. It's like you you buy it for this, you're gonna have this much into it, right? Say you're into it for a hundred a door and you're gonna want to rent to be like eleven to twelve hundred bucks and that's gonna be a, a good deal. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. So I try to keep it simple, like fundamentally, if I can, if I can explain it in terms like that, then it makes sense. If you get into all this complications and that's, that's when you really get into the weeds and I, I generally will avoid those deals. Yes. Agreed. Guys, if you got, uh, some favoritism, some advice, some, um, great things from this episode, send it around to a friend, rate us and reviews, and we'll see you next time. Folks, if you made it to the end of the episode. I'm sure you found some value with what you're listening to. If you could send this to a friend, rate us and review us, share us around. The more that you share us, the more that we can share content with you. Thank you all so much for your time and listening, and we'll see you next time.